Hey, welcome to a new video. People in the past were just like us today. But then again, not quite. In the so-called good old days, it was more about survival for the strongest and luckiest, as even science failed them. Today we'll show you 20 strange things from the past that were normal but are no longer. Are you new to this channel? Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And before we start, also like the video. Number 20. Professional human alarm clocks were individuals hired in the past to wake others at a specific time. This person used a stick to knock on the doors or windows of clients, sometimes even with a pee blower for windows on higher floors. They didn't leave until they were sure the customer was awake. This profession was especially popular in large industrial cities like Manchester and London, and was often practiced in the late 1920s and in some regions even until the 1950s. Professional human alarm clocks also didn't leave until they were sure the person had woken up. This service was useful for people who had trouble waking up or had important obligations that required them to wake up at specific times. Number 19. In the 18th century, it was common for wealthy landowners to encourage people to live in seclusion as garden hermits. These individuals lived in specifically designed caves or small structures and gardens, located on the extensive estates of landowners. They were part of a trend that emerged in response to the English landscape garden tradition and the influence of philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who advocated a return to nature. It involved wealthy landowners hiring individuals to dress as druids, grow their hair long, and live in rustic conditions. Garden hermits were often chosen for their eccentricity and their ability to entertain guests with their unusual appearance and behavior. They usually lived in seclusion and spent their days practicing activities such as gardening, reading, or playing musical instruments. Some garden hermits were even known to perform simple tasks like sweeping or maintaining the garden. Although the trend of garden hermits was primarily found in England, it also spread to Scotland and Ireland. Number 18. In the past, there have been cases where radioactive materials were used in consumer products. For example, Radithor was a popular energy drink in the early 20th century that contained small amounts of radium dissolved in distilled water. It was advertised as a remedy for various ailments, but was eventually found to be deadly after investigation. The American athlete Eben Byers, who drank up to three bottles of the substance daily for years, died from it in 1932. Another product was Thoradia, a face cream that also contained radioactive substances. It was manufactured and sold in the 1930s to 1960s. Radium was also a harmful product used in toothpaste in the early 20th century. At that time, it was believed that radium had health benefits, and it was incorporated into various consumer products, including toothpaste and cosmetics. The idea behind using radium in toothpaste was that the radioactive properties of radium would have a brightening effect on teeth. A well-known case is that of the Radium Girls, who worked in factories where they painted watch dials with radium-based paint. These workers suffered severe health consequences, including damage to bones and tissues as a result of ingesting and handling the radioactive paint. There's also been cases where radium was added to drinking water. In the early 20th century, there were toys that contained radioactive materials, such as glow-in-the-dark paint. Number 17. Witch trials and public executions are dark chapters in history that reflect the religious beliefs and legal systems of their time. Witch trials were a series of interrogations and prosecutions that took place in various parts of the world, particularly in Europe and colonial America, between the 15th and 18th centuries. Accusations of witchcraft were often based on superstition. Women were mainly accused of entering into pacts with the devil and practicing harmful magic. The Salem Witch Trials of 1692 in colonial Massachusetts are among the most well-known cases. More than 200 people were accused, and 20 were executed, mostly by hanging. The accused faced harsh conditions awaiting their trial, including imprisonment, torture, and inhumane treatment. Public executions were a common form of punishment throughout history, often used as a means to deterrence and public spectacle. They were frequently attended by large crowds, making them public events. Number 16. Foot binding was a cultural practice that existed in China for centuries, primarily from the 10th century to the early 20th century. It involved compressing and reshaping the feet of girls with the aim of making them as small as possible. Foot binding was considered an attractive feature and a symbol of beauty and social status. It was mainly practiced by upper class, but later adopted by lower classes as a means to improve their social prospects. However, this process was painful and had long-lasting consequences. The binding process included bending the toes under the foot, breaking the arc, and tightly wrapping the foot with bandages. The bindings were tightened over time, causing the foot to fold at the arc and the toes to be pressed under the sole. Foot binding resulted in several physical deformities and limitations, making it difficult for women to walk and leading to lifelong challenges. Due to these reasons, it was eventually banned in China in 1912 as a result of changing societal circumstances. Number 15. 
Human zoos or colonial exhibitions were public displays in which people from different cultures and ethnicities were presented as living exhibits. These exhibitions were widespread from the 19th century to the early 20th century and were mainly organized by Europe and North America. The purpose of human zoos were to satisfy the curiosity of the European public and reinforce ideologies of racial superiority and cultural dominance. Indigenous people from Africa, Asia, the Americas, and other regions were often brought to Europe and North America to be exhibited in these zoos. They were presented as exotic and primitive for the entertainment and education of spectators. The exhibitions were designed to create a naturalistic environment, often with reconstructed villages or habitats, and intended to suggest the native countries of the exhibited individuals. However, these people were subjected to objectification, dehumanization, and exploitation. Additionally, they were often forced to perform cultural rituals, dances, or other activities for the amusement of the audience. By the mid-20th century, human zoos had largely disappeared. Number 14. In the early 20th century, there were cases where children were sent through the mail using the parcel post service in the United States. This practice, although rare, occurred at a time when regulations regarding what could and could not be sent through the mail were not defined. The introduction of the parcel post service on January 1, 1913 allowed Americans to send packages weighing up to 11 pounds through the U.S. postal system. Some parents took advantage of the service and attempted to send their children or relatives to other destinations. One notable example was a couple from Ohio who sent their newborn baby via parcel to their grandmother's house, which was approximately one mile away. The parents paid 15 cents for the postage stamps and insured the child for $50, after which the mail carrier safely delivered the baby to its grandmother. Regulations were eventually established to prevent further child mailings, and by 1920, the practice was officially banned. It's worth noting that the children sent through the mail were typically accompanied by postal workers and were not simply packaged and sent as ordinary parcels. Number 13. Torpedo bras were a style of women's underwear that emerged in the 1940s and gained popularity in the 1950s. These bras were characterized by their cone-shaped cups, which pushed the breast forward. The shape was achieved through the stitching rather than the use of wires. The design was influenced by fashion trends of that time, and it was intended to enhance the natural shape of the female body, creating a glamorous hourglass figure. The term torpedo bra originated during World War II, reflecting the cone shape reminiscent of bullets and torpedoes. Number 12. Beach bathing machines made their debut in the 1750s, when swimwear had not yet been invented, and most people still swam naked. A beach bathing machine, also known as a bathing box or bathing hut, was a device used in the 18th and 19th centuries to provide modesty and privacy to individuals while they changed into their bathing attire and entered the water. They were usually covered wooden carts with walls designed to be rolled into the sea. They provided a private space where the people could change their clothes and enter the water without being seen by others. The machines varied in design, from solid wooden walls to canvas walls with a wooden frame. These beach bathing machines were especially popular during the Victorian era in Britain. During that time, there were strict social norms and modesty standards, especially for women. The machines allowed women to enjoy the beach and the water while maintaining their privacy and adhering to societal expectations. The machines were often operated by attendants who would push them into the water. Once in the water, the swimmers could exit the machine and enjoy their time in the sea. Beach bathing machines were widely used in seaside resorts lining the coastline. Number 11. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, several cities in the United States passed laws known as ugly laws. These laws were discriminatory in nature and made it illegal for individuals considered unsightly, mutilated, or deformed to appear in public spaces. The purpose of these laws was to remove individuals with visible disabilities from public view. The laws were part of a broader societal movement known as eugenics. The idea was to promote the improvement of the genetic composition of the population by excluding individuals with perceived physical or mental impairments. The laws were often justified under the guise of public health and maintaining public order. However, the enforcement of these laws varied by city. Some cities imposed fines or imprisonment on individuals who violated these laws, while others relied on the police to remove these individuals from public spaces. Number 10. What were menstrual pads made of in the past? Here's one of the answers. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a company called Sphagnum Moss Products produced menstrual pads made of sphagnum moss and gauze. Sphagnum moss, which has absorbent properties and antibacterial qualities, was cultivated in the Pacific Northwest and processed by the company. The moss was then wrapped in a gauze casing to create the menstrual pads. These pads, known as sphagna kins, were advertised as being more absorbent than cotton and claimed to have antibacterial properties. The packaging featured an image of a woman wearing an American Red Cross cap referencing the product's origin as a surgical dressing. 
Despite these claims, the product did not achieve significant success in the feminine hygiene market. The use of the moss was a unique approach during that era. The availability of alternate materials and advancements in tech eventually led to the development of more common and commercially successful products. Number 9. The tradition of trick-or-treat has evolved over time and has its origin in various cultural practices. Going door-to-door -door and receiving treats can be traced back to ancient Celtic traditions. The Celts celebrated Samhain, a festival marking the end of the harvest season and the beginning of winter. During Samhain, it's believed that the spirits and fairies roam the earth, and people would leave food offerings outside their homes to appease them. In medieval Europe, the Catholic Church observed All Souls Day on November 2nd. On this day, the poor would go from door-to-door -door offering prayers from the deceased in exchange for food. This practice was known as souling, and it's considered an early precursor to modern trick-or-treat. In Scotland and Ireland, the tradition of guising emerged. Children and young adults would dress in costumes and go from house to house, where they would sing songs, recite poems, or tell jokes in exchange for treats. The tradition trick-or-treat as we know it today has its origin in early American Halloween celebrations. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Halloween parties and community events became popular. Children would dress in costumes and go from house to house asking for treats. Number 8. During the early 19th century, it was estimated that more than 50% of the workers in some British factories were children under the age of 14. These children were employed in various industries, including textile factories, coal mines, and factories. They often had to work long hours, sometimes up to 12 hours a day, with only short breaks for meals and tea. These grueling work schedules left little time for rest, education, or enjoying their childhood. The harsh labor also hindered their growth. One of the main reasons child labor was so prevalent during that period was the fact that children could be paid significantly less than adult workers. Employers took advantage of this and profited from the desperate circumstances of families living in poverty. The working conditions for child laborers were often dangerous and detrimental to their health. For example, they were exposed to hazardous machinery, toxic chemicals, and physically demanding tasks. They also faced a lack of proper sanitation and safety measures, leading to frequent accidents. Fortunately, the movement to end child labor gained momentum in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Number 7. Table turning was a type of seance that became popular in America and Europe during the Victorian era. A seance is a public gathering where attempts are made to communicate with spirits. At that time, one of the phenomena involved participants sitting around a table, placing their hands on it and concentrating their thoughts on receiving answers from the spirit world. The practice of table turning typically included a small to medium-sized wooden table, a dimly lit room, and a sense of adventure or open-mindedness. Participants would place their hands on the table with fingers spread and pose questions to spirits. They would then wait for the table to move or tilt in response to the queries. Table turning became a Victorian craze in the mid-19th century, and was practiced in grand drawing rooms, middle-class parlors, and modest kitchens alike. It also attracted the attention of scientists. A man named Richard Wiseman created Victorian seances to study the power of suggestion and people's susceptibility to paranormal beliefs. In his experiments, luminous painted bells, balls, and maracas appeared to move before the participants' eyes, leading some to believe they had witnessed the supernatural. Do you think it actually worked? Let me know in the comments. Number 6. There used to be a belief that cigarettes could cause asthma and smoking during pregnancy was not recognized as harmful. In the past, smoking was widely accepted and even promoted in some societies. It was seen as a social activity. The tobacco industry historically ran marketing campaigns that downplayed the risks of smoking and targeted specific demographic groups, including pregnant women. In fact, some mothers intentionally smoked cigarettes to alleviate their anxiety about their pregnancy, which in hindsight doesn't make sense. Asthma is a chronic condition that affects the airways and the lungs, causing inflammation and narrowing of the airways. It's characterized by symptoms such as wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, and a tight chest. While there is various treatments available to manage asthma and alleviate symptoms, there's currently no cure for asthma. Number 5. Bloodletting is an ancient medical practice involving the removal of blood from a person's body. It's been practiced in various cultures throughout history, with different methods and purposes. Bloodletting was based on the belief that imbalances in the body's humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, caused illness, and removing blood could restore balance and promote healing. Historically, this was carried out using various techniques. The specific method and location of bloodletting varied depending on the perceived ailment. For example, it was believed that bloodletting from specific veins or arteries could treat conditions like fever, inflammation, or congestion. Therapeutic phlebotomy is a medical procedure in which blood is intentionally withdrawn from a person's body for therapeutic purposes. It's often used to treat conditions associated with an excess of red blood cells. The frequency and volume of therapeutic phlebotomy sessions are determined by the patient's condition and treatment goals. Number 4. 
A baby cage was used in the early 20th century to provide fresh air and sunlight to babies living in urban environments. The idea behind these cages was to allow babies to spend time outdoors while being safely enclosed in a cage-like structure attached to the exterior of a building, typically outside of a window. They were mainly used in densely populated cities where access to outdoor spaces and gardens was quite limited. Additionally, they were promoted as a solution for families living in apartments or apartment buildings without access to a backyard or garden. The cages were usually made of wire mesh or metal and were designed to be securely attached to the outside of the building. The concept behind the cages were seen as a way to provide a safe space for babies to play and explore under the supervision of their parents. While they were used by some families in the early 20th century, they were not without controversy. Critics raised concerns about the safety and well-being of babies confined to these structures. Number 3. Memento mori is a Latin expression that translate to remember you must die. It's a concept that has been present throughout history and is associated with reflecting on mortality and the transient nature of life. The expression serves as a reminder of the inevitability of death and encourages individuals to contemplate the meaning and purpose of their lives. In art, memento mori is often depicted through various symbols and imagery. Common symbols include skulls, hourglasses or clocks, extinguished candles, and wilting flowers. These symbols represent the passage of time, the impermanence of life, and the reminder that death is an unavoidable reality. The concept has been explored in various cultural and religious contexts. In Christianity, for example, it's been used as a visual reminder of death and the need for spiritual preparation. It's often associated with the phrase, Remember man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return, which is spoken during Ash Wednesday ceremonies. In the 17th century, a genre of still-life painting called Vanitas closely related to Memento Mori emerged. Vanitas painting displayed objects symbolizing the transience of life, such as skulls, hourglasses, musical instruments, books, and decaying fruit. Number 2. During the war years, particularly during World War II, when nylon and silk stockings were scarce due to rationing and resource relocation for the war effort, women turned to a technique called painted on stockings, or liquid stockings, to create the illusion of wearing stockings. This practice involved applying makeup or liquid foundation on a skin tone on the legs to give the impression of wearing stockings. The technique of painted on stockings became popular as an alternative to traditional stockings. Women diligently applied makeup or liquid foundation to their legs to create the illusion of wearing stockings. To enhance the effect, some used an eyebrow pencil or eyeliner to draw a line resembling a seam along the back of the leg. Bottles of liquid stockings became available in salons and department stores in the United States, starting in August 1941. These products were promoted as a way for women to conserve silk and contribute to the war effort. Advertisements claim that an average bottle of liquid stockings contain about 24 pairs of stockings. Number 1. During the Middle Ages, it was common for people to have a sleep pattern known as segmented sleep or biphasic sleep. This sleep pattern involved two distinctive sleep patterns during the night, with a period of wakefulness in between. According to historical accounts, people typically went to bed at sunset, shortly after sunset. They would sleep for a few hours, often referred to as the first sleep. After naturally waking up, they remained awake for a few hours, during which they engaged in various activities such as praying, reading, or spending time with family. After the period of wakefulness, people would go back to sleep for the second sleep, which lasted until morning or dawn. The duration of the wakeful period varied depending on factors like personal preference, social obligations, and the availability of artificial lighting. However, the concept of two sleep periods was not limited to the Middle Ages. Historical accounts suggest that the sleep pattern was common in various cultures and eras before the widespread use of artificial lighting. It's believed that the advent of electric lighting and the modern 24-7 lifestyle gradually shifted sleep patterns toward a consolidated, uninterrupted period of sleep. It's important to note that the biphasic sleep pattern was not universal, and individual sleep habits could vary. What do you find the strangest thing that was done in the past? Let me know in the comments. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos we've made, click one on the screen or take a look at the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.